Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Inside Stories, Conversations About Art and Ideas is an interview series at the University of Georgia hosted by Betty Jean Craig, director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. Dr. Craig, joined by honor students, engages scholars and artists in discussions of their research. Together, they explore the ways scholarship and creative activity challenge received opinion and bring us new understandings of our world. Today, Dr. James C. Cobb, Spalding Professor of History at the University of Georgia, is interviewed by Daniel Jordan, Honor Student and Operations Manager of the Journal for Undergraduate Research Opportunities, and Dr. Betty Jean Craig, University Professor of Comparative Literature and Director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts. Jim, thanks for talking with us today. You probably know more about the past of Georgia, the state of Georgia, than anybody alive today. And uh, we're glad you're alive to tell us about it. Uh, for about 100 years after the Civil War was over, Georgia was characterized as a state of ignorance, uh, poverty, racial violence. Jim Crow laws determined the conduct of uh, blacks in relation to whites. And then it seems like in the 1960s, something changed. And today, I hope we can talk about both Georgia's past and Georgia's present. But uh, Maybe you could tell us what Jim Crow laws are all about. And by the way, who is Jim Crow? Mm, well, Jim Crow is uh, a, a minstrel character, a 19th century uh, minstrel character that was uh, performed in blackface uh, by, uh, by a white performer. And uh, it became sort of the, uh, it, just sort of the a good uh, descriptive uh, term that could be applied to anything that was specifically for blacks or black to which blacks were, were consigned. So uh, segregated cars on the railroads became Jim Crow cars or it, it came down to when we had even separate Bibles for black witnesses in the courtroom, uh, it was a Jim Crow Bible. Uh, and it just because it just conjured up this whole idea of a, of a caricatured, stereotyped black in the minds of whites. Georgia cracker is another term that we hear <laughs> all the time. and, and um, Tell us where that came from. Well, we could get into a big argument, and I could get myself in trouble because that's a hotly debated uh, um, uh, question sometimes. But uh, as I'm, I'm speaking as one, as and certainly as the descendant of a long line of Georgia crackers, but it usually re referred to a, a person, uh, a lower class white person or poor white, who uh, in the antebellum period would not have, of course, owned any slaves and um, might have had no visible means of support. Uh, the, the term probably, though, goes back to herdsmen who used whips to crack over their livestock when they were driving them to, to market or to uh, people who were driving wagons uh, pulled by oxen or, or mules um, transporting material. And my last term is redneck. Where did that come from? Well, that's, you know, that's sort of a derivative of cracker, I guess. I mean, it's, it's meant to describe the same sort of person. The most commonly held uh, idea about that is that, that redneck refers to the, the back of one's neck uh, from being out in the sun uh, working. That, you were, mm -hmm. that meant you were you know, just a common white who actually had to go out and work and didn't have any slaves to do your work for you. And then you know, there are other, other ideas about uh, various political rebels uh, who at times wore red kerchiefs. But hmm. most people, it, it conjures up the image of, a, of an ignorant, uh, uh, shiftless uh, white person. So it's not only a person who doesn't have any money and has to work in the sun, but it's also a person who's not worth much as a character? Well, historically, but of course the rednecks have gone a real, uh, undergone a real sort of uh, uh, renaissance uh, here in the last generation or so with comedians like Jeff Foxworthy, you know, who takes, takes the redneck and makes him sort of a social rebel, someone who just spurns the uh, conventions of middle class morality and, and social norms. And uh, mm -hmm. it's become sort of a, a cult thing to call oneself a redneck. When, when do you think this kind of new redneck thing originated? Because now that you think about it, yeah, I, 
you know, uh, Talladega Nights, that movie with, mm -hmm. with Will Ferrell yeah. and stuff. Sure. Like, when, when did this... When did this start, do you think? Well, it couldn't have happened until after the Civil Rights Movement because right. the redneck was the villain you know, in, the, in the morality play of the Civil Rights Movement. He was always the one who was supposedly involved with the, the Klan and the night riding and the, the you know, lynching and things like that. So uh, it's after uh, the Civil Rights Movement. It's really, I think, in the 70s when the, the South generally in, enjoys a a sort of resurgence in the, in public approval with the Jimmy Carter candidacy and uh, and and rednecks sort of hmm. become you know people start looking at them in a slightly different way. Well, before we got more public approval, uh, we were quite an interesting state in the Jean Talmadge era. And oh. tell us about Jean Talmadge. That was Herman Talmadge's father, and he was governor. Yeah, elected he, governor four times. He, he was uh, elected governor four times in the 30s and 40s, and uh, he was uh, uh, Gene Talmadge was a Phi Beta Kappa from the University of Georgia, a very intelligent fellow. But he, uh, at that point, all the southern states had um, various kinds of laws to keep the power of the cities down politically, and Georgia had a, uh, a system that was sort of like uh, the electoral college uh, if you sat on it uh, and squashed it has really misshapen uh, so that it basically gave way too much power to little bitty counties with small populations as opposed to big urban counties like Fulton County where Atlanta is. And so Talmadge made his career on, on just Kent. Georgia has 159 counties, so all he had to do under the county unit system was carry uh, uh, three little bitty counties with probably a total of 8,000 people in them, and he could cancel out the votes of a half a million people in Fulton County. So he used to brag that he had never... Uh, never campaigned in a county that had a streetcar in it. And why was he notorious? Well, because he catered to the, he catered to the, the perceived ta tastes of the perceived rednecks, as it were, um, in a lot of the things that he did. He, he expressed his disdain for, for people who lived in the cities, for the, the, the lying Atlanta newspapers, as he called them. And he, he claimed to be a, you know, a man of the rural white people, basically. And, uh, but his policies were were quite were typically very damaging to because he opposed uh, improving public education or providing more uh, support for uh, for any kind of public service uh, that would have assisted uh, poor people of either race. And he certainly wasn't in favor of anything for black people. He was a very avowed racist. So uh, he was not really very all that good for country people. But he he managed to convince country whites at least that he was. But how how much was he you know against I Atlanta? You know how how far c can you get by positioning yourself against the, the the capital? You know what I mean? So well, it was more it was more symbolic than substantive because he he was he did he was so smart he understood that there were big corporations in Atlanta who uh, if he ran afoul of them could do him some. Harm and they did uh, on occasion. So like, he, do you, do you well, know any? The Georgia Power Company, for okay, example, cool. uh, which uh, uh, you know, he gave actually gave him money for for many of his campaigns. But Talmadge had uh, he had shrewdly he reduced all of Georgia's automobile tags to three dollars a piece, and he said that I'm doing this for the for the boys out in the country, you know, who don't have that much money. Uh, and this is during the depression, and and of course for a big. Uh, utility company like Georgia Power, which had a huge fleet of trucks, that amounted to a tremendous savings because they're only paying three dollars uh, for a tag for them. So he knew how to sort of talk uh, a good game in terms of hostility to the cities and the, and the corporations. But his, the reality was something different. But Gene Talmadge, in the history of the United States, was bigger than just Georgia. The implications of what he was doing with respect to race relations and and his opposition to uh, desegregation, that was of interest to the rest of the country. Oh, sure. He was, and you he, always write in such a way that uh, you show the importance of what's going on here in, to the rest of the country. Well, uh, he, yeah, he certainly was. I mean, he was kind of a symbol of the really the, one of the last pure, uh, pure breed Southern demagogues, I would yeah. say, who uh, uh, ran afoul of Roosevelt in the, during the New Deal and uh, lashed out at Roosevelt and was just uh, simply outlandish uh, in his in his in his personal behavior. I mean, he would do things like uh, have somebody use a blowtorch when the le legislature wouldn't appropriate money. They just used a blowtorch and cut into the vault and got state funds out. And uh, uh, he was uh, uh, so he's very colorful and he he he, he contributed to this l lingering image of Georgia as uh, as an extremely backward state. 
uh, and by, by a number of his antics, which, which hurt the state's reputation. Well, we can't talk about the history of Georgia without talking about the uh, racial violence and racial tensions and then the desegregation of the university, the university and desegregation of the state. And um, he, Jean Talmadge almost got the University of Georgia blacklisted, and that was bad for us. What lesson did we learn? What did he do? Well, he tried to interfere. He tried to get some professors fired because he thought, this is in the early 40s, he thought they were uh, uh, pushing for uh, integration of the, um, of the university and, uh, and for integration generally. And uh, by trying to interfere in the, in the hiring and the, the, the appointment process, uh, he threatened the, uh, he, he got the university's accreditation threatened. And, and the people of Georgia uh, reacted extremely negatively. So he, he misread uh, the attitudes of, of, the, of even the poor white people of Georgia toward the University of Georgia, their, their level of affection and pride in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he paid for it by being defeated for re-election after he had done this. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, the um, in integration at, at UGA when it, when it finally happened? Well, uh, yes, and I'm, I'm sure he was rolling in his grave when it finally happened. But uh, it, was a, the, uh, it was a dramatic time, obviously. Uh, there was concern about the university being closed uh, because by state law, the governor had the uh, power to do it, and the governor was under instructions from the legislature to close uh, the university if it was going to be integrated. And this was in January of 1961. Of 1961, that's right. And so when... Uh, uh, then uh, Charlene Holmes and uh, Charlene uh, Hunter uh, and uh, Hamilton Holmes were slated to be enrolled. It was, it was a real crisis uh, uh, going on in Atlanta because the, the, the business interests there, by this time, Atlanta has certainly started to emerge as a, as a major player nationally. And uh, they were thinking in terms of how bad it would be for Atlanta's image, not to mention the image of the state of Georgia, for the state university to be closed uh, rather than see it integrated. So a lot of the, of the Atlanta power uh, and influence weighed in on this and, and uh, uh, former Attorney General Griffin Bell, who's recently deceased, played a key role in sort of counseling the Governor Ernest Vandiver to allow the university to remain open. And, uh, and once that happened, it sort of broke the back of, of segregation in Georgia because you had a major institution that was, uh, that was desegregated. So do you think the 60s was the time when we went from being the old Georgia of a, of a, of a segregated, poor, uneducated South to a more energetic, desegregated South? Well, I think to, we, we, went, we moved in that direction beginning uh, with, with World War II and certainly the immediate aftermath of, of World War II. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's a, an argument to be made that Georgia and the South were actually changed more by World War II than the Civil War. And certainly you can argue that the South changed more, has changed more in the period since the uh, World War II than it changed between uh, the Civil War and World War II. So um, uh, it changed the, the, uh, the state's economy, brought in much more industry, was a huge boon to Atlanta, which made uh, Atlanta much more powerful in the, in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of things. So I think the changes are going on uh, almost from the late 1940s. They, they, they start to emerge in the 1960s uh, when Atlanta under uh, William B. Hartsfield you know, adopts its posture as the city too busy to hate and has uh, a very peaceful transition into at least token desegregation of its schools. And uh, all the while the economy is, is skyrocketing in, in Atlanta. And so Atlanta in some ways sort of pulls the rest of Georgia along with it. Can you talk about then, I guess, to zoom in, you know, for more detail about kind of the, uh, you know, towards the end of Talmadge's administration there and kind of the hand that he had in, you know, or well, the hand that he didn't have, I guess. Well, he, he was involved in the, in the famous three governors controversy, even though he was dead. Uh, yeah. He was still haunting the state of Georgia. He'd been reelected for the fourth time uh, as governor. He'd been elected for the fourth time as governor in 1946, but he died before he could take office. And uh, uh, he had, as it turned out, his opponent, and, and this is a sign that Georgia was changing because he had actually lost the popular vote to a guy named James Carmichael, who was uh, formerly the head of the Bell Bomber plant during the war out in Marietta, uh, Atlanta suburb. 
and was then, I think, head of the Scripto Pen Company. But he was the, uh, uh, Carmichael was the better element candidate, the, the good government candidate. And he'd actually gotten more popular votes than Gene Talmadge, but because of the county unit system, Talmadge carried all these rural counties, he was reelected. But he dies before he can take office. So nobody really knows what to do. Uh, there's no direct uh, stipulation in the Constitution about it. Uh, and there have been, uh, there have been write-in votes. A lot of uh, Talmadge supporters thought that uh, he was not looking well, and so they, they actually wrote in his son, Herman, uh, as, the, as the gubernatorial candidate. Herman, Herman as you say in as your book. As he was known, <laughs> as he was known affectionately and otherwise. Uh, and, um, but there were other write-in candidates. Carmichael supporters had written him in, and then there was a Republican candidate also who had, had write-in votes. And, his, and when they looked at the number of write-in votes, it turned out Paul Herman was number three. He was not even the, you know, number two in terms of the, of the, of the count of, for the, for the write-in votes for governor. So uh, they didn't know what to do. Then all of a sudden, way down in Telfair County, where the Talmadges hail from, they discovered uh, 50 or 60 absentee ballots that hadn't been counted. And they were all, as it turned out, for good old Herm. Uh, and they were all, as it also turned out later, uh, from people who had already deceased, uh, uh, were deceased, but uh, out of loyalty to, to the Talmadges, they got the up out of the grave yeah. and voted. And they were nice enough to vote in alphabetical order. And in a great show of unity, they all use the same handwriting. <laughs> so it was quite the, it, you know, in most other states it would have been a scandal. In Georgia, it was more like uh, business as usual at that <laughs> point. But it provoked this crisis of, you know, people challenged uh, uh, Herman's election, and rightly so. And so at one point you had the, the outgoing governor, uh, uh, Ellis Arnold, refused to outgo because he said there was, uh, that Herman was not the legitimate successor. Then you had, as well, you had the lieutenant governor, the duly elected lieutenant governor, um, claiming the office should be his, as well as Herman claiming it was his. So you had three governors in the state of Georgia. But it was one of those things that just it made the state look really, really bad. But I think it also, the, the, the people in Georgia who had good sense particularly, realized that stuff like this had to stop, that it was really hurting Georgia's attempts to progress economically and socially. And I think Georgia sort of turned a corner after that episode, mm -hmm. and though Herman did become governor, he was, much, he was his father's son, but he wasn't his father. He, he became uh, much more uh, active in promoting economic development and supporting public education, and Georgia did, really did uh, start to look like a different state. Well, now uh, I think the world recognizes the state of Georgia because of Atlanta, which is an engine of the economy, but it's also the home of CNN, that's mm -hmm. global right. television. And uh, so sometimes I wonder if there's a conflict because so many of our good writers, like Flannery O'Connor, uh, have depicted Georgia as quite a backward state, uh, full of humorous incidents like this three governors mm -hmm. uh, event. And so th many people who read literature know Georgia as, you know, a source of humor. But the world now sees Georgia, I think, a lot of people in the world as a home of the city of Atlanta, which is a very modern, uh, important city. So do, do you still detect that conflict? I noticed in one of your books you talked about the caricaturing of mm -hmm. Georgians. Yeah, well, yeah, it's still there for sure. Uh, and I think, you know, what you're getting there is very interesting because that the, the best writing about Georgia sort of comes in when it's being uh, plunged into the Depression and coming out of World War II. And um, you're, it's looking in, in, ahead at a, at a future where it looks as though there's going to be some significant change. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a catalyst for good literature all over the world. It's yeah. the, uh, any, uh, you know, more backward societies facing modernization. And so you get O'Connor as a writer, is, is, uh, even though she makes fun of, uh, in, a, in a sort of empathetic way, often of the, of the country people, she's also no great uh, admirer of, of modernity and what she sees it bring. Uh, either, and, and there, a lot of her work is a critique of, of, of modernity. And if you flash ahead then and you look at the way uh, Atlanta has been portrayed in recent years uh, in literature, like Tom Wolfe's mm -hmm. uh, A Man in Full, for example, you know, Atlanta becomes sort of this epitome of, of, a, of a sort of soulless uh, corporate jungle, you know, that, that has, has, is not anywhere, is not any particular place, has no, no particular roots. 
You could even see that, I would argue, in Gone with the Wind, because uh, the way, the way uh, uh, Atlanta is uh, when Scarlett is doing all her uh, uh, dealings to try to you know, save Tara after the, after the Civil War and the unscrupulous behavior, that was just, that was Atlanta. Uh, and so this, there is this sort of uh, critique of modernity that sort of runs through a lot of Georgia literature, and it follows the, the state's modernization. Do you think that uh, if um, somebody from Europe were asking you what Georgians are like, how would you characterize Georgia now? Do you still see two Georgias, the rural and the urban, or do you think, what do you think? We've become a Republican state. Um, well, you just, there's just so many ways to look at, uh, look at Georgia, it'd be hard to... And it's a black and white state, sure. but there are... Hispanic there, also. A lot of Hispanics here and a lot of Asians, so it's a very... Uh, it's a very diverse state now. It's not the yes. state of blacks and whites that it once was. Well, in fact, we're, uh, most people look at us to be the next possibility for a, a majority-minority state. I think it's 42% mm. minority in the population. and Something like uh, a third, probably, of the, of the population has not been, was not born in Georgia. So uh, we really are uh, getting to be the proverbial uh, uh, melting pot. But certainly, I would say if it, it's like going to France are going to Paris and think you've been to France. I mean, you, yeah. going to Atlanta is not the same thing as going to Georgia. I mean, if you get out in the small towns in the countryside, you do see a different culture, a different approach to life, uh, uh, most definitely than you see in Atlanta, where, where there have been so many in-migrants that uh, you really don't have much of a native population uh, uh, compared to, to 20 years ago even. What kind of social or economic or political factors do you see you know, behind this great Im immigration that's been happening that we've just been talking about? Well, Atlanta was just well positioned economically. It, you know, was, it became a transportation hub uh, after the Civil War and it, because so much of the South's real economic progress came not in heavy manufacturing but in commerce and services, uh, Atlanta uh, was able to sort of avoid some of the pitfalls of, of Birmingham, which was a heavy uh, industrial town and it, uh, uh, so post-industrial society Atlanta was prime to sort of jump in there at the vanguard of, of, of the post-industrial economy and uh, become a provider of services and, and technology and knowledge and uh, uh, just uh, and again you know it was well positioned geographically so uh, Atlanta drove uh, and, and its, its growth was so fast uh, that it just drew. It drew in all these uh, Fortune 500 companies and it drew people uh, who, with higher than average incomes and educational levels. So, um, so you, you said so the, the service industry, technology, Dr. Craig mentioned uh, communications like Turner and such. Can you think right. of you know any other uh, any other attributes you, you can characterize Atlanta with? Well, I, th I think the sense of uh, Atlanta uh, was, w gave off. I mean, they did a, an interesting job of promoting Atlanta as a as a place to be. You know, mm -hmm. it was kind of the place um, to be, and um, you could you could move to Atlanta and see, or you could move to Metro Atlanta. What happened is Metropolitan Atlanta grows, and the, and the Central City kind of withers. But you could actually you go because so much of the prosperity and growth was out in the in the burbs. You could miss the underside, the the, the lagging part of uh, econ of the economy of Atlanta pretty easily, and 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 kept it and keep it concealed, and that's mm -hmm. what, that's what happened. So a lot of people didn't understand that there were real, real problems in Atlanta that, that they might not see. But but basically, I think it was it was a place that for for middle class people it could deliver on your your ambitions, and it became that for black people as well. I mean, during the 90s, it was the most popular, and even today, I think the metro Atlanta is the most popular destination for, for African Americans who are moving in the United States by far. And that speaks well for the state of the relations between whites and blacks and in uh, Georgia, but I still see, all, not, not infrequently, um, bumper stickers or license plates with the Confederate flag on it. So how strong do you think the nostalgia the white nostalgia is for the old South. Is is the, are these um, bumper stickers and Confederate flag license plates just a political statement now, an aggressive political statement? Or 
Well, it's kind of hard to read them. Um, you know, there, there certainly is nostalgia for the Old South, and that's not just a Southern thing, too. That was a big part of Atlanta's uh, tourist yeah. uh, sales pitch for a long, long time. Confederate flags are harder to, you know, you, I, I see them on cars in Europe all the time, and I'm pretty sure they don't mean the same thing really? necessarily as, they, as they, they're, they're not really about race so much as uh, the idea of rebellion. Again, it's, it's sort of like the redneck. I mean, a lot of people, I think, sort of embrace the Confederate flag because it's a countercultural symbol and it just sort of means, you know, you can't tell me what to do. And then, unfortunately, there are a lot of people for whom it is a racial symbol still. And, uh, well, the, they don't want to give up. A them. lot of African Americans interpret it sure. as a racial mm -hmm. sy symbol. Absolutely, absolutely. But if you were uh, talking to people about the state of race relations in Atlanta, what would you say? Well, I would say that Metro Atlanta, that uh, uh, which has a, a very large black population, is one of the most integrated metropolitan areas residentially uh, in the United States. Uh, that you 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 you'd have to say pretty good things about uh, the mm -hmm. general state of race relations. I think, I think you get back into Central City of, of Atlanta and you're, what you're getting there is a greater disparity. There's been a certain moving back of whites into the Central City uh, and uh, the black population percentage is actually on the decline there. And you're also getting, uh, at the same time, you're getting growing disparity in wealth or income, uh, racial disparity. So I think there's much more trouble brewing perhaps in Central City uh, the central city of Atlanta than, uh, than the metro area. Hmm. Could, you, could you talk about, uh, I guess, the geography for a second? You, you mentioned earlier kind of how it developed, um, how Atlanta was able to develop with the kind of suburban areas around the outside. But today, a lot of people characterize Atlanta by the kind of, you know, suburban sprawl. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of the worst examples of commuting, they say. You know, so can you right. give any, any other factors for that? Well, I mean, it, uh, southern cities are, are more likely to be that way generally because they developed, uh, say, you know, began really developing like, uh, in the late 19th century or early 20th, and so they have the impact for good or ill of the, of the automobile, mm. which facilitated suburbanization. Uh, and in, you didn't have to, to live, uh, at the time uh, Atlanta was really starting to take off, you didn't have to live in Atlanta per se in order to, to take advantage of its economic opportunities. So that is uh, that's one reason that southern cities in general tend to have a lot of problems with sprawl. Uh, but um, uh, at the same time, all that, just, just the later stage of development, you know, there's more, more technology, there's better communication, there's better transportation so that more of this stuff can be spread out. And um, that allows Atlanta to be a, a little hub in a, about a hundred mile long uh, sprawl of, of, of uh, metropolitan counties. Mm -hmm. Atlanta is very proud of that. Absolutely. Very, very uh, proud. Jim, thank you so much for sharing with us your ideas about Georgia and your knowledge of the of our colorful past. Well, it's my pleasure. And, thank you. Uh, Daniel, it's a pleasure Dr. to work Craig, with you again. Always. Thanks. So, thank you. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.